so we have a special star that is Kale's star. And then another organization, they do these portraits for military families. So somebody painted that for us. My husband adopted Kale about a year after he got married. He was a little boy at two or three years old. And in a big household like ours was, he was just always dubbed as mischief maker, fun haver. He loved to laugh, he loved to have fun. So he was a major prankster. He loved to terrorize his sisters. And he was always trying to just make other people happy. He loved to see them smile. And he was a great kid. He made us laugh a lot. After he got out of high school, he was really drifting. He was trying to figure out what to do with his life. And when he was in high school, he was in ROTC for a period of time. And I think that's what planted the seed in his mind that he was going to enlist in the Army. He knew that he wanted more from himself career-wise, education-wise. Uh, he knew his dad wasn't always going to be there to push and yeah. direct him, and so he thought, if I do this, this will help me to get to that next place. And I was, of course, terrified, because I thought, oh my gosh, this is he's really serious about this. And one of my first calls of the night, after I just hung up talking to him on the phone, was a woman whose son was killed in Iraq, and they were bringing his body back. So I finished helping her, and I went in the bathroom at her office there and I just cried, cried and cried because how am I going to get through four years of knowing that this is the reality, this could be my, um, my potential reality someday. He went off to basic training at Fort Jackson and we were there with him at graduation day and it was just the most amazing thing to see this kid who had struggled so much in life to get to this point and to see him wear this uniform that he was so proud there's just a swagger in somebody when they are in uniform and they're just so proud they work so hard to be there we were just so proud of him you know he he'd actually accomplished something that was really hard for him to do and a few months later he went to go do his advanced training and a few months later he was sent to Iraq As you can see, I am my proof. If you don't believe me, I went to the gym. For me. So, just in case, his backup. Um, he just loved serving his country. That was something that one of his letters back from basic training was he said, for the first time in my life, I'm finally happy. I'm finally happy with me. And he realized that he could do hard things. And so it was great to see him develop into this person that he knew he had all this potential to become. A year later was his return home from his deployment, and over the course of the next few months, we got a chance to visit with Kale. He wanted to go to the kids' high school and pull him out of class, and he's wearing his uniform, you know, and they hadn't seen him since he'd gone back, and it was just this great, tearful reunion at the school. The ladies in the office were bawling and crying because it was so sweet to see him reunite with his siblings. Um, you know, and that was the last time. So we come to February 13th, 2010. My conversation with him was the day before. And I wish that somehow you could know that I could have known that that was the last time I would talk to him. Because I felt like if I could just memorize the details of that call so much better. I remember that he had told me that he had just enrolled in his college classes. He was really looking forward to pursuing his education. And he was so proud that those were finally coming together. He had been working really hard to the next rank of sergeant. And he'd just gotten a big old tattoo on his bicep to commemorate that security detail with his battle buddy. They were getting split up because he re-enlisted and he was going to a new base. So he just said, I love you, Mom. And I said, I love you. Usually I can go about a week in between when I've talked to him kids and checked in with them and the next morning when I woke up he was on my mind and I couldn't figure out why because I just talked to him and I 
dialed his phone and it just rang and rang and rang. And I didn't know it then, but he was already dead. About 9 p.m. we get a knock at the door. And that didn't seem unusual because many times the kids would have a friend or somebody come and say hi and pop in. But I remember hearing um, some voices to my husband and they were trying to verify who he was. And the next thing I know was there was two military officers step into my living room. I knew what that meant. I knew that it meant my son was dead. I couldn't figure out why, why are they here? They shouldn't be here. And the soldier closest to me, of all things, he asked me, you know, how are you doing tonight, ma'am? And I said, I don't know. You tell me. You tell me how I'm doing. And he said, we regret to inform you that your son, Kelder and Clay, have been killed. I just lost it at that point. I just remember crying and I ran and got my kill bear, little bear that I got before he went to basic training. And I knew just, just there's going to be long times that he would be gone and that was the one thing that represented him to me. And so I held on to that bear and, and then my husband managed to get what details they had for us. Kale was one of three passengers, three people in a car. The driver was a good friend that he had served with in Iraq, and his wife had just left him. And so as good buddies do, they said, well, let's, let's go out. And they were out all night long, drinking, doing what young guys do. And about five in the morning, as they were headed back to the base where they served, um, he missed the turnoff, and he's continued up a road that ran past the base. And as he went up a hill and around a corner, he was going too fast. He was in the other lane of, of traffic. And an older man on his way to work was coming down that morning. And he drove a, a big Ford 350 utility truck. another soldier in the back seat. He was 28 years old and he was killed as well. And their friend who was driving, he survived the crash with some injuries. You say those words, Kale's dead, and they just don't seem real. The more you say it, it's like the most preposterous thing that you could say. Then we realized we have to call our kids. And you see this pain that they are in, and you can't fix their pain. You can't even handle your own. And so to tell somebody those kinds of words that your brother is dead is the most cruelest painful thing that you could inflict upon them. Over the course of the next few days, we'd start to receive some of his personal effects, his wallet. There were pictures of the family inside and their state with his blood. There is a substance abuse card inside it. Kale had let us know that through conversations that we'd had prior to his death that he was drinking way too much, you know, between getting back from Iraq and over the years as he was a teenager even I didn't even realize that his drinking helped mask some of that depression and things that he was trying to escape but he was letting us know that he needed to make some changes in his life it just didn't seem real you used to want it to be real you, you I couldn't sleep for so long at nights thinking did he know this was coming? Did he feel pain? 
your body goes on autopilot. It just takes over and functions and your heart crushes completely. And so, yet you have other people that count on you and depend on you to, to be there. And they want to know that they count and matter too, which of course they do. I mean, there's just so many levels of pain. So you're always trying to watch out for other people and you're just trying to survive. You know, there's no, no way to know how to get through this. I think probably one thing that just kills my heart is that I never got to say goodbye to him. It's not like we were able to go see him in the hospital or he was just gone. Hey mom, just calling you from uh, Bangor, Maine. Uh, this is our, I guess, pit stop, then we're going to Ireland, and then to Kuwait, so you missed my phone call trying to give you a call from Ireland, but I uh, love you. I'll talk to you guys later. The driver was a good friend of Kale's. As we looked at his laptop, there were so many photos of the two of them together. They were great friends. I knew that they were hurting as well, and I was trying to just connect with that pain that this other mother was in. Our pain was a little different, but both of our hearts were truly broken. Kale made the tragic decision to get to the car with his friends that night, and it was one that cost him his life. And so I was really mad at Kale for quite some time. Is why, why did you get in the car? How much I wish as a mother I had said, don't. You know, you want to think that you teach them enough, well, don't get behind the wheel, but I don't know, did I say enough? Don't be a passenger to somebody who is impaired. You can hear facts and numbers all day long. That doesn't change behavior. When somebody can connect face to face, when they can see and feel the emotion that's there, that's what changes people. I would say that I've kind of nailed it down to four things, and I call it Kale's Promise. And I ask people to, to take Kale's Promise, and what that means is that, number one, you never get behind the wheel after choosing to do drugs or alcohol. Just decisions already made, just no. Number two is to not get into the car with somebody who is impaired, because you're putting your life in the hands of somebody else that's Russian roulette. Number three, never let somebody leave your presence who is impaired because you can be that last person who could have made a difference. Number four, you'll be part of that change. You have to share that message. You have to influence those around you that this is not acceptable. This is not the way to go. And we each share the, the burden and the responsibility of changing.